All right, welcome everyone. Tonight is probably my favorite of all the talks, the Think Well talk. How many of you, by show of hands, have come to either the Eat Well or the Move Well already? About half the audience. Okay, brilliant. Um, if, if I could ensure that a person came to this talk first, after the spine nervous system one, which is the one that we've all seen already, right? And um, for those of you who haven't seen it, definitely I really encourage you to come to that. But if I could suggest that the best talk to come to first, even before the eat well and the move well talk, would be the think well talk. Because if we don't get our head spaces right, we're going to be fighting a losing battle, no matter what we do in life. Um, and um, hopefully tonight is going to be really quite empowering for you, because it's going to shed some real light as to how destructive your current self-talk might be to your physiology and therefore affecting your actual physical health, but also um, how much potential that you could be achieving if you actually start to tap into the right self-talk. Okay, um, when clients first come in to see me, I can almost tell straight away the people you're gonna do really well and the people you're gonna struggle simply by um, what I can gauge from whether they're more optimistic or whether they tend to look at the life as glass is half empty. Um, and it's because what you think has such a huge um, driving influence on physically what's going to happen in your body. So if a person believes that they're not going to get well, there's no no magic in the world that I can do or anybody else can do that's going to get that person well if they don't believe that they're going to get well. Does that make sense? Okay. So uh, installing confidence initially right from the get-go is really critical um, because any positives that we can do from our side, from a chiropractic point of view or anything else or an eating point of view, etc., will just be unraveled by um, any pessimistic or destructive self-talk. And we're going to sort of delve deep into each of these, these uh, topics tonight and try and tease out the most important things that we can start to work on. Because my job at the end of the day of tonight is not to give you a nice talk and you all have fuzzy feelings afterwards. And it's, you know, my job is to actually make sure that tomorrow you actually start doing something different with the way you start thinking. Okay? So we're going to put some real practical tips at the end of tonight as well. Okay. I'm going to start off with a brilliant uh, bit of research that was done not, not many years ago, actually. And it was done on two groups of uh, grade 7 students. What do they call grade 7 now? You know, they're about 12-year-olds. Okay? And there were 100 of them. And all of them were doing badly in maths. And they divided this group of 100 students up into two groups, each of 50 people. And to the first group, they taught that group... Well, basically, they took them through a whole course on um, study skills. Okay, they were taught study skills, study skills and how to improve their maths. And then the second group of students, they gave them a mini neuroscience talk um, on the brain's ability to change. That was obviously appropriate for twelve-year-olds. And at the end of the three-month trial, who do you think ended up started getting better maths results? The person, the, the group that were doing the study skills or the group that was taught a mini, mini neuroscience talk on how to improve their brain's ability to change? The obvious, the second one. Yeah. Okay. Now, that might not appear so obvious to many people, but that just highlights just how important it is that a child starts to believe that they can do maths. If they don't believe that they're ever going to be good at maths and they just rubbish at maths, you're up against a brick wall. But if a child starts to believe that, you know what, I, actually, actually, I can do this. You've all heard of that saying, I think I can, I think I can, I know I can, I know I can. The little engine that could, eh? Um, if we start to believe in ourselves, it literally changes the way your brain operates physically. It's not a placebo thing. Your brain literally starts to become smarter if you start to believe that you actually are smart. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So by the end of the semester, group two that did the neuroscience course 
had significantly better grades than Group 1. Joe Dispenza is probably arguably the world's expert at the moment on neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is the science of how the brain can actually change. It's plastic, okay? It's not rigid. And for many years, we've all been taught that the brain is very rigid. You know, that the moment you're born, you, you die, you're, you've got gray cells dying in your brain. You've all been told that at some point, eh? Um, and actually, it's not true. That's not true at all. Neuroplasticity is really the big buzzword now in neuroscience at the moment. And Joe Dispenza, you could say is arguably one of the experts because of his own personal experience that he went through, which led him to becoming such an expert. I'm just going to quickly recap a little bit of his story because it's really quite an incredible story. He was, funny enough, originally a chiropractor, believe it or not. And um, he was a cycling enthusiast and he was doing a road race. And he got hit by a car and his spine was crushed, fractured in multiple places. Um, it was a serious emergency. He was rushed to hospital you know, braced up, etc. And when he got to the hospital and they did all the CT scans and MRIs and all the rest of it and x-rays, the surgeon said to him, listen, you're going to need surgery, otherwise you're never going to walk again. And he knew what spinal surgery meant. He knew that that meant that they were going to fuse his spine, which meant that it was never going to move properly ever again, and that his chance of a normal life after that was not ever going to be the same. And given the fact that he had a background in chiropractic, he knew the importance of keeping a well-moving spine in order to have optimal health. For those of you who haven't already come to my spine nervous system talk, if your spine is not moving properly, the nervous system cannot function properly. The spine is the suit of armor that protects your nervous system. And you've got to think of your brain a bit like a battery and the spine is the generator. A well-moving spine is what charges up the brain. So if the spine stops moving because it's been fused, what do you think happens to the brain? It goes flat. It starts to shut down. And when your brain shuts down, what does your brain control? Everything. So everything now starts to go pear-shaped. So he knew the importance of keeping a well-moving spine, which is why getting regular chiropractic adjustments is absolutely critical in this modern sedentary world that we now live in if you want a healthy brain and nervous system to keep your spine moving. So he was in a dilemma. Surgeons were telling him, you need surgery, otherwise you're not gonna ever walk again. He knew if he had surgery, his spine was gonna be fused. His quality of life basically was tickets for the rest of his life. And so he declined the surgery. And he said, listen, um, I believe that we can actually do this another way. The surgeons, now you've got to remember this is in the States. The surgeons um, were really quite angry and because he didn't just accept their advice. And so they said, well, listen, we cannot look after you at all, and neither can the hospital, if you're not going to follow our recommendations. So they literally, he had to get his friends and his family, had to wheel him out the hospital, and they, take, and they had to take him, and then they took him home. And under his direction, he told them what they must do. Basically, he was only able to lie face down without moving. Yeah, he wasn't braced or anything, but he wasn't allowed to move. Face down, he had a hole that he could breathe through, and he was fed through the hole, and he drank through a straw, through a hole, for at least three months, not moving. And in that three months, what he did is he chose to start to use his brain to activate the healing potential in his body. He had a lot of hours to kill lying there doing nothing. And so for many hours each day, at least seven hours each day, all he did is he visualized in his head using all his senses what it was going to be like to be fully healthy again, <laughs> running, cycling, living the life that he should have been living. And he, in these visualization processes that he did, he envisioned all the tissues knitting together, all the bones healing together, and all the nerves firing the way they're supposed to. And obviously because he had an in-depth understanding of the anatomy and physiology of the spine and nervous system, he was able to do that at a very detailed level. 
and then he was able to engage all his senses as well to try and imagine what it was going to be like to be doing all the things that he loved doing again. And he did that for three months solid. And then after three months, he was able to move just a little bit. And um, after six months, he was able to get up and start to walk around. After eight months, he was back to normal. And he walked back to the hospital eventually. And he said to the surgeons, here I am, no surgery, and I'm fully functional and I have all my capabilities back. And they were floored. They couldn't believe it. And he explained to them what he did. And he explained why he did it. And he explained to them the concept of what neuroplasticity really is and the power of what our thought can actually achieve if we put our mind to something. Since then, he's gone on to become arguably one of the world's leading experts in neuroscience. And he, and he has... Um, he gives conferences and seminars all around the world now to many different professions. Uh, many of them are neuroscientists as well. He's got a book called Evolve Your Brain. Has he been able to demonstrate that everyone is capable of doing this sort of thing? Yes, and that's what I'm going to teach you tonight. Everyone is able to do it depending upon how much they engage their brain. But everyone has the potential to do it if the will is there and that's the difference is if the will is there and also the discipline which is huge it takes a lot of discipline to focus on something for seven hours a day for three months okay and a lot of people just don't have that discipline and so they often will try to just choose the easy way out um, but he's written a book now it's called evolve your brain I highly recommend it. it's a brilliant book and also he's written a second book called you are placebo and basically, he's talking about really how much the power of thought can literally change everything. Placebo is now a very real recognized intervention. It's no longer considered, you know, when all else fails, just to try placebo, or that's what the quacks get involved in. Just to give you an illustration, right now at the moment, in hospitals around the UK there are currently surgeries being done on shoulders that basically involve just opening the person's shoulder up and then closing it up and then telling the patient later that they've had a proper shoulder surgery and it's normally for debridement to try and shave off all the sort of arthritic bits of the shoulder because in the past, what was happening is when people underwent these kind of shoulder surgeries, the outcome was so poor, even though practically it seemed to make sense to shave off the joint of all the roughened edges, once they had had the surgery, because of, all the, because of the invasiveness um, of the surgery and the scar tissue that was being created, most people ended up having more complications after the surgery, and certainly they didn't have any significant improvement or very few did. And um, eventually surgeons realize, you know what, um, it seems though that when, and often a lot of these things to start out by luck, when they initially go in, check to see if they can do the surgery, and for whatever reason, they weren't able to do it, and they closed the person up, um, and the person then thought they had a real surgery, the outcome always seemed to be better, even though they hadn't done anything in there. Because the patient believed that the surgeon had done something that had now made them better. And they believed so much that they had that the brain now actually was able to engage at a healing level that they hadn't been able to tap into previously. So what they're now doing in several hospitals now in the UK right now, and I know this because I was sitting in the conference when the surgeons were discussing this. So this wasn't I heard from a friend of a friend who I read this in a book. I was in the conference when this was happening. And they now are rolling out as a, and this was four years ago now, um, a trial study to see if mock surgeries on the shoulder for this particular shoulder problem are, should be rolled out into the main NHS and to all, all hospitals. Because the results of these few hospitals that were <clears throat> doing these mock surgeries were now showing that the results were much, much better 
than people who had actually the real surgery. And so the ethics committee then got involved and they said, this is not ethical. You cannot tell a patient that they're getting a surgery and then lie to them and, and open them up, close them up, make them believe they've had a surgery and then not actually do a surgery. And they then, the surgeons then responded, well, what's more ethical? Opening them up, doing the real surgery, closing them up and making them worse or actually telling them we've done something but we haven't, but they actually get better. So medicine is now beginning to recognize the real value of placebo. And it's because we're only just beginning to understand really how powerful the brain is. And it's really only since 2000, between 2000 and 2010 was earmarked the decade of the brain worldwide amongst all medical research. They, they, they put a lot more funding and research manpower into trying to understand the brain more between 2000 and 2010. And as a result of that, that 10 years of research, we've really begun to understand a lot more really as to how important getting our mindset really is. It's the last frontier in medicine, isn't it? Is the brain, because it's so complex. After God himself, it's the next most complex thing in the universe is the human brain. It is the next most complex thing in the universe. It's incredibly, incredibly complex. And we're only just scratching the surface as to really how much we understand about it. So Joe Dispenza wrote this, how and where we place our attention, what we place our attention on, and for how long we place it, ultimately defines us on a neurological level. And that obviously can work for the good or for the bad. <clears throat> we can get into what we call a vicious circle of thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking. Which basically enables us to memorize, memorize ourselves as a personality. When we engage in such cycles, we, can, we condition the body to be the mind when actually the body is meant to be the servant of the mind. In other words, the servant becomes the master. This is problematic and a dangerous substitution because what it means is that the mind is essentially going to sleep and the body now starts running the show. So even though the mind thinks it is running the show, the body really is. We have to show the body who is boss. And just to give you an idea of how biology is very much in our favor. We have 10 times more nerve cells running from our brain to our senses than the other way around. So we're wired biologically to be able to ensure that the brain controls the body. But so many of us are stuck in the cycle of we feel and therefore we think, which now influences our thinking. And so that now makes our feeling worse, which then makes our thinking worse, which makes our feeling worse, which makes our thinking worse. Does that make sense? So we're stuck in this feeling, thinking, thinking, feeling scenario. So let's start with pain, because let's be honest, many people initially come in because of pain. They're in pain. All they can think about is pain. And I understand that I experienced pain when I was 12, debilitating low back pain, so much so that it prevented me from playing sport that I loved. So I understand about pain. And I understand it's the most important thing that we're trying to address quickly when people first come in. But unfortunately, if we focus too much on the pain, we're actually self-destructive. Because the more you focus on your pain, that's all you can think about. And then it actually creates stress to your brain, which now influences, influences negatively your brain processes and your thoughts. And so you end up feeling now more pain. And so you feel more pain, so you think about it more, and then that makes you feel more, and you end up in that vicious circle. So when people initially come into me, and I hear all their challenges and their problems and their pain, etc., but then a couple of weeks into their care, they keep telling me about their pain. I try to tell them, let's not focus on the pain. It's not because I don't care about your pain, but it's because I know at a neurophysiological level, it's actually causing you to become more painful if you keep talking about it and the fact that you keep talking about it is just reminding your brain again and again and again of fundamental problems does that make sense okay we have to break the cycle um, 
And I appreciate people need to obviously share what they're experiencing first. But what we don't want is we don't want to keep reinforcing that pain cycle by constantly talking about it. Okay? And it's the same with anything that's negative. You don't want to keep talking about negative, destructive things because all it does is it sets up default synaptic connections in your brain. And the more you think about those thoughts, the, the bigger and stronger the synapse becomes. So eventually, you don't even have to really think about it and that synapse fires off because it's so reinforced. And in neuroscience, it's what we call um, cells that fire together, wire together. Let me give you an example. Uh, okay, so you have a bunch of neurons in your brain that are associated, let's say, with your mother. Okay? And you have a bunch of neurons in your brain that's associated with love or hate. Now, there are many people who've grown up and they've had very, very destructive relationships maybe with, let's say, their mother. I'm going to use that as an example in this instance. And so every time they think of their mother, they think of, I hate my mother. Because of, obviously, whatever things happened when they were growing up. Okay? And it might be quite legitimate. The problem is this, though. Is every time they think about their mother and they keep talking about how much pain or how much hurt that, that, that their mother has caused them, and every time they talk about it to other people, and every time they think about it, every time she's done something... Um, that's offended them, you start creating a really strong synapse between those bunch of neurons mother and the bunch of neurons hate. So eventually, whenever you think about mother, you automatically will think about how much you hate your mother. Or whenever you think about how much you hate a person, automatically the connection is made to your mother. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, does that make sense so far? Yes, no? Yeah. Okay, you must stop me if it doesn't, okay, because it's important you guys get these fundamental concepts. And it's because a synapse, which is a neuronal connection between those two groups of neurons, has been made and it's being reinforced so often because every time you think that thought, it creates a stronger synapse until eventually a fairly flimsy synapse becomes a really strong highway of communication. And so it's now becomes your default your default way of thinking. Every time you think mother, you think how much you hate her, and every time you think how much you hate a person, you're going to be thinking about your mother. So nerve cells that fire together, wire together. And this can work both for us and against us. The plastic paradox is that the same neuroplastic properties that allow us to change our brains and produce more flexible behaviors can also allow us to produce more rigid ones, like this one I've just described. Therefore, unlearning has to take place before we can relearn and rewire. So if we have got these destructive type synaptic connections in our brain, we have to break those and start to unlearn them and then create new ones. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so an example of that would be um, every time you think of your mother as an exercise, you're going to deliberately, no matter how hard it might be, and to be clear, I have no problems with my mother, I absolutely love my mother, okay, I'm just using this as an example. Um, every time we think of my, our mothers, we need to intentionally think of all the possible good things that is about my mother or your mother. No matter how hard that might be, there might be literally only three or four things, and there's a thousand on how on the things that make you don't like it. But you've got to then focus on those three or four things. So maybe you can say, well, she was a good cook. Or she, you know what, she was actually really kind to her neighbors. Or whatever it is, okay? She was a really good wife, whatever it is. And um, all you do is you just intentionally focus in on that. And it just takes you literally a minute every single day for 30 days to effectively create a strong synapse, a strong new synapse. So for 30 days consecutively, you think about all the good things about your mother. And a good technique is to just um, use your iPhone or smartphone and just talk to your phone on the dictaphone, saying all the good things about her. 
and then you just replay that to yourself every single day for 30 days consecutively and it has to be 30 days consecutively because it takes 30 days of repetition for a, a reasonably strong synapse to be connected in your brain so if you get to day 29 and you forget to do a day guess what you go back to day one okay it's the repetition of it because the reason why it's, you've created this unhealthy synapse in the first place is you've repeated over and over and over yes over in your head how much you dislike her so you now have to do the opposite does that make sense okay we touched a little bit on the feeling and thinking and, and, and thinking and feeling. And I said to you, this sometimes can end up making us memorize, our, well, this enables us to memorize ourselves as a personality. So how many of you have heard of people say, well, that's just who I am? Okay? Whatever behavior they get involved in, you know, whatever strange way of thinking they have, Maybe it's they grumpy, or they get angry, or whatever it is. And now they say, well, that's just who I am. I was born like that. I'm sorry, that's rubbish. It's learned. And the problem is, is when we first learn these bad habits, we don't even realize we're creating these big synapses. But every time we think and we perform a certain habit and behavior, we reinforce that synapse till eventually it becomes such a strong default that eventually it becomes just natural and we now begin to think that that's just who that's our personality that's who we are but it's not right okay that's not true and the great news is is you can break that you can break that okay great leaders always believed in a destiny that they could not perceive with their senses Mahatma Gandhi, Queen Elizabeth, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, they all essentially said the same thing. I have this dream, I have this vision, this concept in my mind, and I'm going to live as if it's already happening. Okay, that's the key thing. I'm going to live as if it's already happening. So what they're doing here, and this is, I think, really important, is when you start to visualize something and have a dream about something, don't just think about it and just have nice thoughts about it. You need to physically feel what it's going to be like to be in that, that visualized scenario using all your senses. What is it going to look like? What is it going to sound like? What is it going to feel like? And so on. And this is quite important. In fact, it's very, very important. You have to not just think about it. You have to physically feel what it's going to be like to be in that visualized dream situation. Okay, but guess what? That takes practice and it takes discipline to do that because you've got to spend the time um, and the intention on it. Remember, going back to what Joe Dispenza said, how and where we place our attention, what we place our attention on, and for how long we place it ultimately defines us on a neurological level, which in turn will define us also on a physical level. And we're going to talk about another very good experiment that they did, which is really quite mind-blowing. They had um, a group of cancer sufferers. And the one group, they divide the cancer sufferers up into two groups. And the one group, they gave those people with cancer normal chemotherapy. And the other group, they gave them effectively placebo pills, sugar pills. But both groups were told that they were being given chemotherapy. And they were also told of all the side effects that chemotherapy will produce, or likely to produce. You know, from vomiting, nausea, to even things like hair loss. And after both groups had been in the study for several months, guess what happened they all got very similar symptoms they got the nausea the vomiting and even the hair loss even the group that were being given sugar pills because they really believed that that was what was going to happen it's frightening isn't it this is all documented it's really quite unbelievable 
for warning people about possible side effects is not necessarily a good idea. If you drum it home, yeah. out. <laughs> because they're going to start to believe it. Okay, it's the power of the mind is huge. And this is why, you know, you've heard of people, they go into the, the consultant or the doctor and the doctor says, you've got three months to live. Guess what's going to happen? They're literally going to go home and they're going to start mentally preparing their body to shut down in three months. And if they hadn't been told that, they could well have gone on to live two, three years. The power of suggestion. It's really quite unbelievable. So we've got to be very, very, very careful what we say to people. Especially when you're talking about things like that. And this is why I literally pull my hair out, no pun intended, when I hear doctors saying things like that. Because it is not helpful. Did you know that there's never been a single disease ever that a person has not made a complete recovery from? Even the most aggressive brain tumor. There's never been a single disease that a person hasn't, somewhere in the world, at some point in time, made a complete recovery from. Nothing's an absolute. And when you start telling people an absolute, you're not doing them any favors, unless it's a good thing. Okay? But obviously, you've also got to be, don't give them false expectations. Okay? Um, all right. A new dawn in health science has arrived. Research is now clarifying beyond any reasonable doubt. I'm hoping for a moment that you're actually listening to me and not just watching the video up there. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering why there was a few glazed faces there. <laughs> okay. A new dawn in health science has arrived. Research is now clarifying beyond any reasonable doubt that how we choose to eat, move, and think determines both the quality and quantity of our lives. Diseases once thought to be due to genetic predetermination have now been shown to be the direct result of lifestyle choice. Let me repeat that. Diseases once thought to be due to genetic predetermination have now been shown to be the direct result of lifestyle choices. So for those of you who haven't come already to the either the eat well or the move well talks, how many of you have heard that we're sick because of bad luck, bad germs or bad genes? That's bad science. And ever since we mapped out the human genome in 2002, we now know that. We thought there would be about 150,000 genes before we mapped it out. You know, that was about enough genes then that could cater for all these different diseases and problems that we have. You know, then there's a cancer gene, a heart disease gene, an autoimmune disorder gene, and, and so on. But we only ended up finding about 25,000 genes. So what we realized is one gene can express itself in a multitude of different ways depending upon the environment that it's put in. If it's put in a normal, healthy environment, in terms of how we eat, move, and think in our stress, it'll express itself normally resulting in normal physiology and health. If it's put in a toxic, deficient, stressful environment with destructive self-talk, it's going to result in abnormal expression resulting in disease and abnormal physiology. So literally what you think will actually change the way your genes express themselves. That's pretty deep, isn't it? That's power. It's what, we now, it's what we now call epigenetics, and it's the study of how the environment influences the expression of your genes. And your internal environment, i.e. what you're thinking, is part of that environment. So the lifestyle choices we make each day have a greater impact on our health and vitality than anything else. If you want to experience health and vitality and prevent illness and suffering, a wellness and lifestyle doctor is the greatest asset available. And I'll obviously agree with that. <laughs> no bias, of course. Okay, but he, this was written by Dr. James Chestnut, arguably one of the world's leading experts in wellness at the moment. He now lectures many of the medical professors in North America. He's not lecturing the students, he's lecturing the professors. Funny enough, he was a chiropractor, and he still is a chiropractor. Um, so, believe it or not, the chiropractic profession worldwide is really making huge inroads into uh, the future of where we're taking health. And it's because the chiropractic philosophy resonates with all the wellness principles. And it has done so ever since 1895 when it first was developed. And we're now just doing full circle and going back to some of those original principles. So all health and vitality are the inevitable results of body, mind and spirit functioning in a state of balance and harmony. 
Your body, mind and spirit are genetically and spiritually programmed for balance and health. Experiencing lifelong health and vitality is normal. It is your genetic and spiritual destiny. All illness and suffering are the inevitable results of body, mind and spirit functioning in a state of stress. You are not genetically or spiritually programmed for illness or suffering. You only do so in order to survive environmental stresses. Experiencing illness and suffering is not normal. It is not your genetic or spiritual destiny. Remember, healthy is normal. Unhealthy is abnormal. Unless you're in one of those unfortunate 5% of the population that has a true genetic problem, the rest of us, 95%, it's really up to us. Okay? And you could also argue your parents and grandparents to a degree because unfortunately how they, how they ate, thought, and moved um, will also affect the condition of your genetic makeup to a degree as well what we call bioaccumulation. Okay, so unfortunately, your lifestyle, if you haven't yet had ch kids, will directly impact the health of your kids. And if you've already had your kids, what you were doing in your first 20, 30 years would have had a huge impact on the health of your children. Okay, so it's... it's um, it's quite, it's quite a responsibility, isn't it? It's now not just for us. It's also for our, for our the next generation and so on, and our grandkids even. So there are two underlying causes that keep your body, mind, and spirit in a state of balance and health. Sufficiency and purity. So basically, your body, mind, and spirit receive what they require to express health and vitality. And purity, your body, mind, and spirit are free of toxic inputs that force the expression of stress, function, and illness. And the opposite applies for what causes our, our body to be driven into a state of stress and illness. Deficiency and toxicity. The body, mind and spirit do not receive what they require to express health and vitality. And your body, mind and spirit are poisoned with toxic inputs that force the expression of stress, function and illness. So looking at yourself in your mirror every day mm. and say, I hate myself, I'm ugly. That would be considered a toxin. It's a toxic input to your body. And it will actually have a physical manifestation in your body as well. Not just mentally. And I think we tend to kind of think it'll only affect us mentally. But I'm hoping that after tonight you're going to see that it's actually going to begin to affect you physically as well. We now have thought, communication, and emotional stress patterns that are completely deficient and toxic. And our 21st century environment contains many more emotional and physical stresses. Would you agree that we're probably more stressed today than we were 50 years ago in terms of ongoing daily stress? Yeah. Okay? I mean, if you look at kids today, you know, teenagers today, they have way more stresses that they're being exposed to than than when we were, when we were kids. You know, our lifestyles are much more unhealthy, much more unhealthy now. And these are all stresses to your body, whether they be physical ones, chemical ones, or emotional ones. I mean, now the big stress of these days is social media, okay? There are so many young teenagers on Facebook and things who are desperate to try and make sure they get the perfect Facebook picture to stick on Facebook because if they don't, they get all this negative criticism. And guess what it's doing to their morale and their whole way of looking at themselves? It's completely eroding it. And so young kids are being exposed to a lot more stress than we had. These patterns are incongruent with the human requirements for health and vitality and the result is pandemic levels of chronic stress and illness. Humans have become the world's sickest animal species. We are the only species on earth that has fundamentally changed our thought, communication, and emotional stress patterns away from what we require for health and toward what creates chronic illness and suffering. The World Health Organization have said that we can no longer maintain strict artificial divisions between physical and mental well-being. Okay. I'm going to just pop this off for a moment now because all you guys are going to do is just sit and read boring notes on a 
PowerPoint, and that's not going to be helpful. Clinical studies have shown how emotional, cognitive, and spiritual beliefs can directly affect physical well-being. Remember, physical well-being has an equally powerful effect on emotional, cognitive, and spiritual well-being. So chiropractic has huge potential in this area. Why? Because when we perform an adjustment on your spine, we're actually changing your brain, which will now change the way you think. So we're not just changing you physically, but we're also going to change the way you interpret things psychosocially. Remember, the brain is a battery. The spine is the generator. The better the spine moves, the better the brain works. And the better the brain can interpret its environment more accurately, not just physically, and navigate things physically, but also emotionally as well. So can you now see why people who are, who um, were once depressed when they undergo chiropractic care some of them can end up actually breaking free from depression and certainly those who start exercising and in incorporating all the other eat well move well think well principles can very easily break through from things like depression because we know that chiropractic adjustments reduce cortisol levels. Cortisol is that stress hormone in your body. Okay? It's, that, it's that thing that causes you to go into that fight-flight state. Okay? And, it, and cortisol and adrenaline basically causes your cells to break down. It's the complete opposite of healing. Whereas chiropractic adjustments reduce cortisol levels. So it helps push the body into a more healing state. Physically and mentally. Okay. So no wonder it can also then increase immune function and also decrease things like depression and anxiety. At Harvard University, women in mind-body support groups for infertility can see 44% of the time as opposed to the normal 8 to 10%. So simply by being in a body-mind support group, their chances of falling pregnant is hugely improved. And that's just by a body-mind support group, let alone you know, incorporating all the other wellness principles of getting adjusted, eating healthily, exercising, and so on. Um, men in the similar mind-body groups are able to decrease their hypertensive medication. 80% of them are. And 16% of them are able to stop their antihypertensive medication altogether. It makes a huge difference. Now, I can't change your self-talk for you, though, which is why when clients come here, we're working here as a team. Okay, my job is to remove the interferences in your nervous system and restore normal motion and posture to your spine. But what we have to do as patients is we've also then got to do our part and start to do these other things, eat well, move well, think well. And there are many clients who come here who don't come to these talks and my heart sinks because they're only ever going to get so far without actually incorporating these other things as well. Without a doubt, clients who come to these talks or watch these talks always get better results all the time. So there's nothing magical about human physiology that allows us to have stressful negative thoughts dialogue and emotions without severe consequences to our health and that's why it's important that tonight you guys learn how to start to take charge of your thoughts and your self-talk i can't do that for you but i can show you how all right okay if you think about it no drug or surgery will ever solve such problems as lack of happiness lack of inner peace or lack of self-esteem or basically unconditional love if you have a lack of unconditional love no drug or surgery will ever ever be able to solve the problems that are caused by a lack of unconditional love and thinking so you know and or being made to believe so I'm sorry that's ethically wrong no drug or surgery will ever solve such problems and no drug or sur surgery will ever create real permanent love, happiness, inner peace or self-esteem. 
we've got to learn the techniques to be able to generate this. I'm just going to skim through all these. Just bear with me while I go through these slides here. Yeah? Okay, so what we're going to teach you tonight are what thought, communication, and emotional patterns are sufficient and pure that result in health and vitality, which ones are deficient and toxic, resulting in illness and suffering, and what is required in order to consistently choose healthy behaviors and consistently avoid unhealthy behaviors. We're going to start We'll just focus on a few basic concepts. To, to elaborate a little bit further on this. We're going to talk about the concept of innate values. Innate values. Innate values are things that are stamped on our heart from the time we are born. They are not learned. They are basically stamped on our heart from the time we're born. They're stamped in our genes, hearts, and minds. Innate values do not change. So an example of an innate value would be um, loving someone and being kind to someone is a good thing. Stealing is a bad thing. No matter what culture you go in around the world, Love and kindness is considered a good thing. Stealing is a bad thing. All right? <laughs> so we don't have to learn these. We just inherently know these things. And what's interesting is that you, um, even when you've got young children and you haven't taught them necessarily everything about right and wrong, obviously you do your best, but when they've done something wrong for the first time, They've just got this guilty look on their face, don't they? Because they just innately know that that was wrong, what they did. You, they hadn't been taught that yet. They hadn't experienced that yet. They just innately know. And likewise for the positive as well. They just innately know when they're kind and loving, that's a good thing. So your values, think of your values a bit like your compass in life. Okay, they are what you are innately designed to use to form and evaluate your own belief systems. They're basically going to give you direction in life, okay? I should, you know, right, wrong. That's really what it's going to tell you. This is right and that's wrong. Belief systems, on the other hand, are what we would refer to as your paradigm. Your paradigm of thinking. Your paradigm or belief system can change. It is learned. They are formed. Paradigms are formed. They are not innate. So, let me give you an example. My paradigm is obviously a wellness paradigm. I'm talking about myself for a moment here. Yeah? So when I get a headache, what I'm going to think of immediately is, why have I got the headache? I'm either stressed about something, or I'm dehydrated, or I haven't got enough sleep. That's why I've got a headache. Okay? Most likely. Let's rule out the brain tumors and all the rest of it because that's the 1% of the time. Okay? So I most likely got a headache because of one of those three. Okay? I'm stressed, dehydrated, and I need some sleep. So my answer to my headache will be based upon my paradigm I need to drink some water, I need to get away from whatever stressful situation I'm in, get adjusted to dampen that stress response in my brain and then maybe go get some sleep. Okay? That's my paradigm. Now, an alternative paradigm or way of looking at that scenario is if you get a headache, like probably 95% of people in the UK, if they get a headache, they're going to think, I need a paracetamol. So they go to the pharmacist or the shop or whatever and they get the paracetamol. And they take the paracetamol and it gets rid of the headache. So their paradigm is if I have a symptom or pain, I need to take a drug to get rid of the symptom. It's been learned. Why? Because the moment they were born and ever since then, every time little Johnny or little Jane got sick, guess what? Mommy or daddy gave them a pull. Or they went to the doctor and they got a pull. 
So they've learned that health comes from outside in, not from inside out. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, here's the thing about belief systems or paradigms. Is because they are learned and formed, obviously they can change. Which is what I spend my life trying to do with people, is I'm trying to, including what happened to me also, is taking them from a sickness drug model of healthcare and I'm trying to educate us into a wellness model of care. Okay? So they can, they can change. Now what's important though, is that your belief system, if it's an accurate belief system, because you, have, you can have correct ones and you can have incorrect ones, as we know. If your belief system is an accurate belief system, it needs to be congruent with your innate values. That's the litmus test. If you have an accurate belief system, it needs to be congruent with your innate values. Let me give you an example. Many people come into my clinic and they'll say to me on their first consultation, and I've said nothing, I'm just listening. They'll say to me, Doc, I don't like the way that I'm on 10 different pills and every time I go to the GP, he just gives me more pills. This is not right. I'm not sick because of a lack of drugs. There's something going on here and I need to find out what's causing this. They innately know that drugs are not the answer. So in this scenario of when you get a headache, just take a paracetamol. Unfortunately, it's an incongruent, that belief system is incongruent with your innate value. You don't have a headache because of a lack of paracetamol. So getting yourself involved in an activity or action that perpetuates that belief system is obviously not going to be helpful. So think of your belief systems in life as your map. So we've all got a compass that tells us right or wrong, but our map's going to determine ultimately where our destination is. And if you've got an inaccurate belief system, where's your destination going to be? Not where you want it to be. So if throughout your life you thought that health comes through a bottle of pills or drugs, where are you going to be health-wise by the time you're 50 or 60? In a good health destination or an un unhealthy destination? Do you see what I'm saying? Okay. So it's very important that we learn accurate belief systems because otherwise we're going to get to the wrong destination. And the destination basically is your life purpose <coughs> or what ultimately ends up with you. Let me take you another, uh, let me use another example. Um, some people, their belief system is if I get rich, I'm going to be happy. Okay, this is a classic cliched one, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so their belief system is if I get rich, I'm going to be happy. Well, we know how many very rich people are very miserable, sad, lonely people, right? Okay, and so if they make their belief system all about trying to get money. Their whole life purpose just is about trying to make money. And they're gonna, where's their destination end up gonna be? Not a happy one. Because they adopted an inaccurate belief system, an unhealthy paradigm. Because it wasn't congruent with their innate values. And what's an innate values? Unconditional love of others. So if you're, if you're, if you're making money, to the point that now you're actually stomping on other people's, um, whatever, you know what I mean, okay? If you're trying to make money to the detriment of other people, then that's, that's going to cause you problems. And often the love of money is the root of all evil, right? We've all heard of that. And it's because if you're so determined to try and make money at all costs, you're going to actually now st step on other people's toes to do that. And that's what causes a lot of problems. Now, I'm not saying making money is a bad thing, okay? Because making money, money is a neutral thing. 
It can either be used for good or it can be used for bad. <clears throat> if, however, making money is something that you're wanting to do so that you can enrich the lives of others around you, well, that now is resonating with an innate value. So that's actually going to be a good thing. So this is why you can get, you know, these um, <coughs> not entrepreneurs. What's the word I'm looking for? Philanthropist. Philanthropist. Okay. You know, people who that do good is who are trying to use their money to really improve the world. Okay. But even on a small scale, um, you can obviously use that yourself to help people around you, friends, family, and so on. Okay, your local community. All right, so hopefully you can understand then the importance of having the, the right belief system if you want to eventually reach the right destination. Now this is what's critical. Your belief system is ultimately going to determine your behavior. Okay? Your belief system is ultimately going to determine your behavior. So if you think making money is what's going to make you happy, guess what you're going to spend your life trying to do? Doing things to try and make money. Okay? If, however, you believe that helping people is going to, what making, is going to make you happy and fulfilled, you're going to spend your whole life doing things that are going to be trying to help people. Okay? Okay. So just remember, your belief system will always determine your behavior. And think of your belief system or paradigm as basically your self-talk. So the reason you've learned that every time you get a headache is I need to go and take some paracetamol is because you've said that over and over in your head that when I get a pain or a symptom, I need to get something, a drug, to fix the problem. Or you've heard that, and you've reinforced that over and over in your head. So really, when you break it down, your, your paradigm has been formed by your self-talk, what you've constantly said to yourself over and over again. That becomes your paradigm. So let's take a scenario. You have a life event. Let's say you are... Um, laid off, made redundant. Scenario one, so you've got two people, person A and person B. Person A, you made redundant. Let's assume that person A is the kind of person who tends to think of life, look at life as though the glass is half empty. So they're going to say immediately, that's typical, that's not fair, Life sucks. It always happens to me. Because that's what they've said their whole life over and over and over in their head. Life's not fair. It always happens to me. Because of a destructive self-talk that they've learned somewhere along the line when they're probably much younger. Or maybe older. But somewhere along the line they learned a, a, a faulty belief system. That now affects their self-talk. So what they're going to now do is they're going to say, um, you know, I, I'm, now, I'm going to be ruined. You know, I'm not going to be able to support my family. You know, um, you know, life is basically going to get so much worse for me. You know, basically all doom and gloom. How do you think that's going to affect their behavior, the emotional behavior? They're going to be miserable. You don't want to be around that person. Okay, because they're just going to pull you down. There's really two people. They either take you to the basement or they take you to the balcony. Who do you want to hang around with? People who take you to the basement or people who take you to the balcony? The balcony. The balcony. Okay? You don't want to hang around with people who drag you down the whole time. You're constantly talking destructive, negative um, things. So it affects their behavior and their emotions. Which unfortunately, because their emotions now are stressful, anxious ones and negative ones, that's going to cause a psychoneurophysiological response, which will literally change their physical state, their physiological state, which will now drive them towards physiological adaptation, basically illness or disease. Put it this way, every time you have a thought 
your brain produces a chemical. And depending upon what kind of thoughts you have will determine what kind of chemical your brain produces. So if it's a negative, destructive thought, you're going to produce a chemical that's going to result in the negative, destructive neurophysiological pathway. Because that chemical that your brain has produced from that unhelpful, destructive thought is literally going to cause um, the development of a certain protein, which in turn will cause the production of a certain hormone or enzyme. And the type of hormone or enzyme is ultimately determined by whether it's a positive thought or a negative thought. And those hormones or enzymes will ultimately now determine what happens physiologically in your body. So literally your thought will produce a chemical which will produce a protein, which will produce a hormone, protein or enzyme that will ultimately change your physiology. That's what that basically means. Conversely, if you have a good thought, you're going to produce a good chemical resulting in a good protein which is an anabolic one, a building up one, not a breaking down one, resulting in a healthy or a helpful hormone or enzyme. All right. So that's person A. Okay, the glass is half empty person. Person B, you made redundant. And they look at it as, you know what? This is an opportunity that I've been waiting for that, can, that I'm now able to now do something really different in my life. I wasn't totally fulfilled in this job I was in. I'm now being forced to actually go do something different. And they look at this as an opportunity as opposed to a negative thing. And it's because their belief system, as a result of their self-talk that they've learned over the years, has been, well, everything happens for a reason. You know, so bad stuff happens, but obviously there's going to be a good reason for why this has happened, and in time I'll find out about that. I'm just now, for now, excited about the possibility of change and something different. So immediately they're now more optimistic. They now start brainstorming all sorts of different entrepreneurial ideas, for example, that they now may have, which they have for years neglected or didn't have time for because they were so busy doing their 9-to-5 job. And so they're now getting involved in something that maybe they're really passionate about instead of just doing the 9-to-5 job because it pays the bills. And they now have a real opportunity to make something happen, which they then actually enjoy doing, and who knows, makes maybe more money. So they're going to be positive people to hang around with. Okay? You enjoy being with them. They're uplifting. They're therefore going to have a much more positive psychoneurophysiological response resulting in a much more uplifting physiological state and a much better physical health. Does that make sense? All right. Okay, so our paradigms are critical, absolutely critical. We need to make sure we learn the right paradigms, which means we need to learn to start to have the right self-talk because your self-talk will ultimately determine your paradigm. So if you've been saying your whole life that life is not fair, you're going to end up having a faulty paradigm. If your whole life is, you know, things happen for a reason, there's, got a, there's a good reason for this, you're going to have a very different response. So it's not what happens to you that matters most, but it's how you respond to it that matters most. Okay. So your belief systems, ultimately, determined by your self-talk, ooh, ultimately drive your emotions that you have, which eventually form your behavior. Sorry, which determine your behavior and your actions, which will also ultimately determine what kind of health you end up having. All right. The good news about this is you have 100% control over your own self-talk. You thus have 100% control over and responsibility for your emotions and behaviors. Your self-talk will drive your emotions and behaviors. So if you're finding your emotions are not what you want them to be and your behaviors and your actions are not what they want to be, stop looking at the emotion or the behavior. 
That's just the symptom. You need to start to focus in on the cause, the self-talk. That's where it's coming from. Change your self-talk, you'll change everything. And tonight we're going to show you exercises you can start to do to change your self-talk. Okay. Martin Luther King said, The person who has nothing in their life that they are willing to die for has nothing in their life really worth living for. And I'm going to challenge you tonight. Is there something in your life that you are prepared to die for? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if there's not, why not? Because it means you're not living out your true passion. And you need to find what that is. Because then you're going to get to your ultimate destination, your life purpose. Because if you're prepared to die for something, that's really important. And now you're more likely to achieve that, that life purpose. <coughs> so on the road of life, your life purposes are your desired destinations. Your belief system, self-talk and paradigm are your map. And your <coughs> values are your compass. Trying to start to change your self-talk does not involve hours of therapy talking about the past, trying to forget your past, or avoiding people or situations from your past, or creating unimagin sorry, an imaginary, unrealistic future. Why is not talking about your past helpful? Because you can't change your past. It's done. Your past is done. There's no point talking about and thinking about your past because we cannot change our past. Focus on the present and the future because you can change that. And people who dwell on the past, they're missing huge opportunities. Whereas when we focus our intention on the present and the future, literally the opportunities are really endless. We're not where we're at because we are our own worst enemies because of our self-destructive talk. Emotional and behavior modification doesn't work because emotions and behaviors are simply the effect of your belief systems and self-talk. You have to change the self-talk. None of us go through life free of challenges, obstacles, and hard lessons, right? We've all had them. Granted, some people have had more than others. I accept that. I totally get that. Life is full of challenges, but challenges are full of opportunities for learning and growth. Happy people have the same amount of life challenges as unhappy ones. They just respond to challenges differently. Adversity does not build character. It reveals it. Adversity does not build character. It reveals it. I know of some incredible elderly people who've gone through hell. And yet they've turned out to be amazing people. And on the flip side, I know of other elderly people who've also gone through hell and they're miserable, cynical, bitter people to their grave because they chose that path. It doesn't have to be like that. I often think that age tends to exacerbate really who we, who we really are based upon our self-talk. As people age, have you noticed, maybe it's just me, and this is no science behind this at all, it's just purely an, uh, an observation I myself have made, and I'm only 40 years old. So, um, But as people get older, they either become really happy, loving, peaceful people, or they can become really bitter, angry, resentful people. And you don't tend to get much middle ground, because they've basically slowly diverged through life. Because they've chosen a certain self-talk pathway and after decades of that pathway they're now at polar opposites. You don't have to agree with me because there's no science behind that but that's just an observation. In order to try and now start to change your self-talk though, don't try and do it in the heat of the moment which normally triggers your unhealthy behavior. So, for example, if you get angry every time your husband doesn't bother go take out the rubbish and he knows it's Wednesday night and he should do this and it just irks you every time he 
doesn't take out the rubbish. I'm, think, I'm talking about it, just a simple example. Trying to now change your self-talk in the heat of the moment when you're just literally wanting to lash out is not the time to try and do it. The only way you're going to change your self-talk is when you're alone in the quiet of your room and you rehearse it in your mind. You rehearse the scenario. Okay, it's Wednesday night. It's now 10, 11 o'clock at night. We've finished watching the TV together. He still hasn't taken the rubbish out. How am I going to respond? And you play it over in your head. And you rehearse yourself doing the right way of doing it. Talking to him nicely, whatever. Okay? Or her. This, don't get me wrong. It's, not, <laughs> it's obviously both ways here. Um, so basically, trying to develop the right self-talk skills during periods of stress and challenge is like trying to develop the skills of driving by entering the Indy 500. It's not going to work. Okay, You've got to learn to drive, not in the stressful situation. The game or race simply allows you to demonstrate your skill and evaluate your skill under pressure. This is not the appropriate or effective time for developing your basic skills. Daily practice is where you develop your skills. So the things that we're going to exercise we're going to teach you tonight are the things you need to be doing daily in your own quiet time when there's no stress around you. Okay, so have you all got a pen and paper? I think you have, eh? I want you on that pen on the piece of paper. This in the top hand left corner. I want you to write down the five most important qualities of a good person. So write down, in your opinion, the five most important qualities that a good person has. So you might say they're loving, they're kind, they are compassionate, they, um, you know, whatever it is. They are faithful, they're honest, whatever it is, okay? Okay, these basically re represent your personal values. They are innate, okay? And they're not going to fall outside the umbrella of unconditional love of yourself, others, God, and or Mother Nature, whatever it is that you believe in. Now rate yourself next to each of those five on a scale of 1 to 10 on these qualities. So if you, th if you put down kindness as an important thing, you need to rate da write down how kind are you. 10 being, I'm um, like amazing kind, 0 being, you're just awful. And what you're going to be, start to realize is you're going to start to become, well, you're going to become subconsciously aware of all the incongruencies within these innate values of yours. And all these incongruencies cause emotional and spiritual stress and significantly affect your health. So if you've only put down you're a 5 out of 10 for being kind and you've rated kind as an important thing, that's going to create stress in your life. Because it's something you value and you know you're not doing it. Or you're not very good at it. Now, for every quality that you scored less than 10, describe in detail, and some of this you're going to need to just do at home. But you're going to need to describe in detail what you need to do to improve. Not to score a perfect 10, but just what do you need to do to improve your current score. And visualize yourself performing these actions. So if you put kind, then maybe if they're taking the rubbish out on a Wednesday night is your um, weak link, you can start visualizing yourself, making sure that you do those things without your wife having to nag you. Okay, and you can obviously do this for all the different ones you've written down there. And you're going to need to just do this at home. Now what you want to do then is pick one of those that you really would like to work on. And for the next 30 days, every day, visualize yourself doing what you need to do to improve in that area. Not to be perfect, but just to improve. Just pick one. And pick the one that, you know what, I think I could easily get better at this. Don't pick the one that you're going to really struggle with. Pick the one that you think, you know what, this is a good starting point. Let me start with this one. And each day, visualize yourself what you need to do to improve in that area. 
for 30 days consecutively. And you can do this for basically any of these things. Next thing you can do is set a timer every 15 minutes to go off during the day. Let's say for an eight hour period on a work day and then also do one on a weekend day. And every time the timer goes off, I want you to quickly jot down what you've been thinking at the time. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to literally just make a quick note of oh, I was thinking about, oh no, I haven't gone to the shops yet and my parents are coming for dinner. So you write down worried, haven't gone to shops yet. Okay, so every 15 minutes you just quickly write down what you're thinking at the time. And what this is going to do is it's going to make you aware of just how really what your self-talk is you're going to be able to really self-evaluate yourself really well. And you're going to begin to see how either negative or worrying or anxious your self-talk actually is. Because for many people, they don't actually believe how destructive their self-talk is until they do this exercise. It's going to be a bit of an eye-opener. So I'm preparing you. <laughs> I'm warning you, should I say. If you are reacting to a situation at the time when the buzzer goes off, to let's say to a person, maybe you're in an argument with someone, you know, um, write down how they are responding to what you're saying at the time as well, and how well was that working for you, and then what you need to do in future to improve their response. So basically, you're trying to now evaluate your your self-talk and how that's affecting people's responses to you. So you're basically you're evaluating any reactions of others to your response. So you're going to begin to realize how either effective you are at communicating things or ineffective you are based upon their response, which is ultimately being determined by your self-talk which caused you to say those things. This is how you determine the effectiveness of your interpersonal communication skills. And then when, for instances, when you know you haven't got a good response, visualize yourself as to what you need to do to get a better response the next time around. So if it's something that you know is likely to recur, visualize what you need to do to get a better response. Some people, um, when the timer goes off and they are thinking something negative or destructive, they might create a switch. So they might just attach an elastic band around their wrist and they just flick the elastic band. Make them, okay, no, I mustn't think about that. Try and think about something positive. Or take a deep sigh, count to 10, and then change your thought onto something positive. You cannot empty your mind. You can only change what you're focusing your mind on. You cannot empty your mind of thoughts. You can only change what you're focusing on. Okay, and that's a choice that you have. No one can do it for you, but you have the power to choose to think about something else instead. Okay, so I think in summary, always choose then belief systems that are congruent with your values, as you will always engage in self-talk that is congruent with your belief systems. Always choose to believe that it is best to engage in self-talk that is focused on present and future solutions and opportunities. Always evaluate your belief systems and self-talk by asking, is this making me feel better? Is this making my life better? If it's not making me feel better or if it's not making my life better, don't think about it. Okay, move on to something that is because it's only going to hurt you in the long run. Always choose positive, optimistic, grateful, and empowering belief systems and self-talk. And you want to create a daily affirmation self-talk routine that is present tense, positive and emotional. So you might want to say each day. And the best time to do a daily affirmation, how many of you know what a daily affirmation is? Okay, maybe one. A daily affirmation is saying something to yourself out loud with passion and vigor believing it, even if you don't really want to believe it, but believing it um, so that you can start to change 
or create, should I say, new synapses in your brain. So for example, I'm a loving, kind, honest person and I feel proud of myself for choosing to be this way. Now some of you are going to think, no, mm, that's all so American and just, ugh, and just eek and sleaze and all the rest of it. Here's the thing. It might seem cheesy, but you're doing the same thing, but just destructively. So you need to start to be intentional about engaging on choosing to focus on positive things. So pick things though that really resonate with you. And even if at times you don't really believe it, you want to start to say it with enough passion that you will eventually start to believe it. Because there will be some things, let's say you've really been struggling in an area of your life. Let's say you've been dishonest. And you want to say, you know what, I want to change this. So every morning you're going to wake up and say, you know what, I choose to be an honest person always telling the truth. So even though that, that might be something that's been difficult for you, by saying it each day and really trying to believe it, if you do this for 30 days consecutively, guess what's going to happen in your brain? You're going to create a new synapse and your brain will automatically default to doing the honest option. Because you've wired it now like that. You've programmed it to be like that. You've become a dishonest person because you've programmed it to be like that in the first place. So we need to unprogram that. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, I think you get the, the idea there. And do it the first thing in the morning because this is the best time to create any real meaningful change in the brain. Because after you've just woken up and you've been in that subconscious state, and before you fully awake, that's actually the best time. When your brain's going from the sleep deep delta brain frequency mode into the alert beta um, day mode, between the two is the best time to change your brain. So the first thing in the morning when you wake up or the last thing just before you go to bed when you're really knackered is actually the best time. One of the two. But I'd suggest the first thing in the morning is better because you've now prepared your brain for being in the right mode for the rest of the day. Okay, So if you don't do these things in the morning, you're making a big, big mistake because you're, you're energizing your whole day by starting the day right like that. So many people wake up in the morning and they go into reactive hindbrain mode. The first thing they do is they turn on their phone or their computer and they read their emails and all the problems that are happening in their life. And you immediately go into hindbrain um, reactive mode, which is stress mode, which is basically killing you. We need to engage into the creative mode, the uplifting mode, which is like doing these visualizations. So you now can start to take charge of where your future is going instead of just reacting to stuff that's happening to you. Happening to you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, so my poor staff know that there's a waste of time phoning me in the morning until I at least get here because I don't turn my phone on. Because all it is, it's very rarely good stuff. It's always problems. So I don't want to know about problems first thing in the morning. I want to get my headspace right for the day ahead and create solutions by being in the right f mindset, in the right frame of mind. It's very important to make sure first thing in the morning you set aside that time, even if it's just five minutes, on your own. And I really quite like it when I'm outside doing my exercise at the same time because you can just marvel at, uh, at nature and you know, you're getting the fresh air, you're getting some exercise mm -hmm. going. And it's not easy to be more relaxed and, and uh, creative. But you can do it in your room as well. That's great. That's fine. But just make sure you're on your own away from distractions. And if you're not spending five minutes at least every day alone time and doing some form of meditation or praying or whatever it is that you do, it's a big mistake because you're just in hindbrain reactive mode then from, from the start. And you're never really going to get that, 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 um, um, that head start that, you, that we all need. Okay. Each of us has a certain amount of personal energy and power available to us each day. How we eat, move, and think all play a major role in how much energy we have at our disposal, how much energy we drain each day, and how much energy we put back into our tank. 
Each day there are many challenges that occur in our environment that we do not control. Dealing with these challenges always requires a certain amount of energy, a certain amount of, per of personal power. Each of us has a finite amount of personal power to use each day. The secret to maintaining your personal power and energy is to always focus on the things you control and not wasting your time and energy on the things you do not control. Focus on the things you can control, not on the things that are out of your control. So a good example of that is don't try and change your spouse. Change yourself would be a good example. You have complete control of yourself. But guess what? Your spouse will probably change when you start to change. Again, I personally have witnessed that. Um, so that would be a good example. The next thing you need to start to do is you need to start, you must use self-talk that anchors or associates positives to any behavior you want. And so you must use self-talk that anchors or associates positives to any behavior you do want. And you must choose self-talk that anchors or associates something negative to any behavior you don't want. Let me give you an example. Let's imagine I've got a box of chocolates here and they are your ideal chocolates, whatever they are, Quality Street, Arrows, whatever it is, dark chocolate, whatever it is. And if I all offered you a box of one of these chocolates right now, and forget I'm a wellness doctor, you'd probably take that perfect chocolate, right? However, if I in front of you now lace that chocolate with arsenic, Tasteless, odorless, colorless arsenic, but it will kill you. And then I offered you that same chocolate. Are you going to take the chocolate? Mm. No, obviously not. Why not? Because I changed your belief system about that chocolate. I changed your belief system from, well, this chocolate's going to make me put on a little bit of weight, to this chocolate's going to kill me. And as a result of your belief system changing, your self talk changing, your behavior changed. Your self-talk drives your behavior. So what you've got to start to do is if you want to start to change key behaviors, you need to start to change your self-talk about those behaviors that you're wanting to change and make them more accurate. I, sorry, I, I don't quite get that example. I, I, I don't understand why the belief system has changed. The belief system is a chocolate, a normal chocolate is, is uh, naughty but nice. Um, an arsenic based chocolate is bad whichever way. It's, it's the belief system isn't changing, it's just the data has changed. The data's changed, which now means the way you view chocolate is different. So, what I'm trying to get at is um, I'm just using this as an example. Yeah. When you now view that chocolate, if you let's say you want to give up chocolate, okay? And I'm glad you raised that, it's a good point, Rich. Let's say chocolate's one of the things you want to give up. You know this is a dis destructive behavior. The way you're going to give up that chocolate is not by willpower not eating chocolate. You need to start to change your self-talk about what you're saying to yourself about that chocolate. So we're going to do an exercise here. We can do it right now. Okay? Flip over your piece of paper. And on the left-hand side of the page, I want you to write down a behavior that you know is bad that you want to change. So, in this example, let's say, I want to give up chocolate. I know it's not good for me. I want to give it up. So, write down on the left-hand side of the page all the things that you say to yourself to justify why you should eat that chocolate. Well, you know, I've had a tough, stressful day. I deserve this little treat. You know, or that smooth texture in my mouth is exactly what I need at the moment. Or whatever it is that you say. Or, you know, it's only going to make me a little bit it's only maybe going to put on a few pounds, but it's not really that bad. It's naughty, but it's, it's, it's a nice naughty. It's not really that bad. So, say all, so write down all the things that you say to yourself to justify why you, you eating that chocolate is acceptable. And then on the right-hand side of the page, I want you to write down all the things that that chocolate bar is actually physiologically going to do to your body and be as scientific as possible. So. The first thing you can say, well, it's going to spike my blood sugar level. 
it's going to increase my cortisol, it's going to cause insulin resistance, it's going to increase my chance of cancer, heart disease, diabetes. These things will all kill me and make my life worse and less enjoyable. It will increase weight gain. I will have less energy. I'm not going to sleep as well tonight. I'm not going to be able to concentrate as well in an hour's time. I'm going to feel sleepy in an hour's time. It's going to affect my work performance. It's going to make my, uh, me a little bit more irritable and more likely to lash out. And you can go on and on and on and on and on. And so what you're getting at is what you want to then start to do is you then focus just on that right hand side of the page and every day for 30 days consecutively you now just say to yourself the right hand side page stuff. And you can play it over your dictaphone and replay it to yourself every day. So every time you now think of that chocolate bar you're not going to be thinking of all the excuses that you normally tell yourself. You're going to be so brainwashed and hardwired into thinking what that chocolate bar is actually doing to me physiologically that you now will think that that chocolate bar is killing me. Yeah, it might not kill you as quickly as arsenic, but it's killing you. And it's certainly making your life shorter and worse quality. So what I have done is I've effectively changed my belief system about chocolate. I used to think it just makes me put on a little bit of weight. I now think it's actually going to kill me. If I continue to eat chocolate bars, I will guaranteed have a worse, shorter life. Does that make sense? Yeah. But great point, Rich. Thank you for saying that because that's what most people are thinking. And now, guess what? Your behavior is going to change because now when you are offered the chocolate bar, you're less likely to go for it because you now are thinking of all the bad stuff that that chocolate bar is really going to do to your body. I have a weakness for pizza. I love pizza. I love it. But I've got to the point now where for most occasions I can now instead of just eating one and a half pizzas I'll only have maybe two slices at most if it's a treat weekend because I know the damage that that pizza is going to be doing to me and even then it happens maybe once every six months whereas beforehand I would have been eating it once a week at least. Why? It's not because I can't afford pizza anymore okay I'm no longer a student it's because I know what that pizza is actually going to do to me because I've changed my self-talk and therefore my belief system of what pizza really does to my body. Okay? And you can do that to all things. So you can do that for a bad behavior that you're wanting to try and change and you can also do it for a good behavior that you're wanting to try and uh, adopt. So for example, um, I want to start exercising every day. It's the classic, right? Um, but at the moment, you hate exercise. Well, I hate exercise. I hate exercise. Well, I'm going to get up at 5 o'clock every morning to exercise. But I hate exercise. No, I am through sheer willpower and determination, I'm going to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. What do you think is going to happen when the alarm bell goes off at 5 o'clock? Well, you're probably going to hit snooze. Okay, You're not going to get up because you don't like exercise, so why on earth are you going to want to start exercising? So the only way we're going to be able to start exercising is instead if we have the belief system of I love exercise. And the only way you're going to start to love exercise is by writing down all the great things exercise does for you physiologically and you literally brainwash yourself in thinking about that for the next 30 days consecutively and the great thing is you can sit on a couch eating pizza, watching mm. DVDs and listening to this stuff and not exercising for 30 days consecutively. But after 30 days, you'll be so desperate to get off that couch and exercise because you've now totally transformed the way you think about exercise. You're thinking about all the amazing things exercise is going to do for you and all the damaging death things that is going to happen to you if you don't exercise. Because we've changed the belief system. And it simply was because we changed the self-talk. Okay. It's much easier to get unhealthy people to start doing healthy activities like eating healthily and exercising regularly than it is to get healthy people to stop doing healthy eating and to stop exercise. Did you know that? 
Sorry, say that, say that again. It's much easier for healthy people, sorry, it's much easier for unhealthy people to start exercising and to start eating healthily than it is for healthy people to stop exercising and to stop eating healthily. Is biological law on our side? Most definitely. Because we are wired to be drawn to doing the things that are actually going to really make us well. Unfortunately, a lot of people have the faulty belief system in thinking that all this healthy stuff is actually going to be good for you. They think, oh, it's just deprivation and I'm no longer going to have any fun anymore. Because they've wired that into their brain as a self-destructive, unhelpful belief system or paradigm. There we go. Unhealthy people don't anchor pain to eating junk food, being sedentary or engaging in negative self-talk. In fact, they mistakenly anchor pain to healthy behaviors. And that was simply because of destructive self-talk. Not because it's true. It was faulty destructive self-talk. And you speak to the healthy people and you'll find out why. Because when people actually start doing these things, they're so glad that they did. You can be and uh, sorry, you can be and achieve anything you want in life if you take the time to visualize, develop a realistic practice plan, to develop the necessary skills, and choose self-talk and belief systems that empower you to follow through. So your homework is to go home and pick one of the five things that you valued as a about a good person. Pick one of those five and visualize yourself doing things or saying things that are going to improve that score that you currently have. Not to be a perfect 10, but just to improve what you currently have. The next thing is to pick a, a, a bad behavior that you're currently engaging in that you want to stop. And right on the left hand side of the page, all the things you're saying to yourself to justify why you do that bad behavior. And then on the right hand side, write down all the things that are actually going to happen as a result of you engaging in that bad behavior at a physiological cellular level. If you need help, please speak to me. I will tell you exactly what those things are going to be doing to you. Or go to a textbook, you'll find it. And then rehearse over and over again that right hand side of the page. Record it on a dictaphone and play it to yourself every day for 30 days consecutively. Do the same thing then for a good behavior that you want to start doing okay like exercise or whatever it is and do the same again you think you guys can all manage that okay it's not a lot and also set the timer for every 15 minutes for a day for a normal working day and then for a normal weekend and then write down what you're actually thinking at the time of the timer going off so you can evaluate truly what your self-talk actually is you're not going to know that there's a problem until you actually see that there's a problem. So start with that one first, probably. Okay? I'm going to show you just a few clips here to hopefully inspire you and motivate you. Um, this is a five-year-old girl's daily affirmation, which I thought was quite cool. This just gives you a, a fun example of what your daily affirmation should look like. But in adult, this is a kid's version. Look, I can be a shark. Now, my whole house is great. I can do anything good. I like my school. I like anything. I like my dad. I like my cousins. I like my aunts. I like my Allisons. I like my mom. I like my sisters. I like my dad. I like my Do you see her body language and the vigor that she puts into it? Now, that's what we need to incorporate, all right? Um, I thought that was amazing. And she's going to grow up, I'm sure, to be a very, very influential, powerful person. This is a little bit more serious. Let me tell you something you already know. 
The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Pain is temporary. It may last for a minute, or an hour, or a day, or even a year. But eventually, it will subside, and something else will take its place. If I quit, however, it will last forever. The margin for error is so small, I mean, one half a step too late or too early, and you don't quite make it. One half second too slow, too fast, you don't quite catch it. The inches we need are everywhere around us. They're in every break of the game, every minute, every second. You got a dream, you got to protect it. People can't do something themselves, they want to tell you you can't. Want something? Go get it. Period. Don't be afraid to fail. You can't always win, but don't be afraid of making decisions. You have to believe that something different can happen. He who says he can and he who says he can't are both usually right. That most of you say you want to be successful, but you don't want it bad. You just kind of want it. You don't want it badder than you want to party. You don't want it as much as you want to be cool. You, most of you don't want success as much as you want to sleep. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. Deep down, dig deep down, ask yourselves, who do you want to be? Figuring out for yourselves what makes you happy, no matter how crazy it may sound to the people. Make a choice, right? You just decide what it's going to be, who you're going to be, how you're going to do it. Just decide. Why not? Why can't I be the MVP of the league? Why can't I be the best player in the league? See why, why, why can't I do that? What did you say to the kid? It ain't about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. Get up. Get up. Get up. And don't ever give up. We can stay here, get the shit kicked out of us, or we can fight our way back into the light. We can climb out of hell. One inch at a time. To be able at any moment to sacrifice what you are for what you will become. Most of you won't be successful because when you're studying and you get tired, you quit. I don't do well in math. You're right. You ain't never studied. I'm not good in writing because you have never written before. Talent you have naturally. Skill is only developed by hours and hours and hours of beating on your craft. If you are not making someone else's life better, then you're wasting your time. Don't cry to give up, cry to keep going. Don't cry to quit. You already in pain, you already hurt. Get a reward from it. Now if you know what you're worth, now go out and get what you're worth. But you gotta be willing to take the hits and not point the finger saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. You're better than that. Because every day is a new day. Every moment is a new moment. So now you got to go out and show them that I'm a different creature. Now. I'm 
will show you how great I am. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke it is written, the kingdom of God is within man, not one man nor a group of men, but in all men, in you, you the people have the power. The power to create machines, the power to create happiness. You the people have the power to make this life free and beautiful, to make this life a wonderful adventure. Now, what are you gonna do? Because limits, like fears, are often just an illusion. Winners are born from people who have the right mindset. And I don't just mean winners in athletic competitions. Um, they're born out of their mindset and how they approach life. I think humankind have been given an incredible brain. And this is why we're able to achieve such incredible things. But how we use that brain and how we choose to use it is really going to determine whether we succeed in life or not. I'm just going to show you just a final little clip here that just highlights to you how some people have managed to truly succeed in life even though they were beaten down when they were very young and told that they would never succeed. But they chose to defy that. You have the same choice. Dismissed from drama school with a note that read, wasting her time, she's too shy to put her best foot forward. Turned down by the Decca recording company who said, we don't like their sound and guitar music is on the way out. A failed soldier, farmer, and real estate agent. At 38 years old, he went to work for his father as a handyman. Cut from the high school basketball team, he went home, locked himself in his room, and cried. The teacher told him he was too stupid to learn anything and he should go into a field where he might succeed by virtue of his pleasant personality. Fired from a newspaper because he lacked imagination and had no original ideas. His fiance died, he failed in business twice, he had a nervous breakdown and he was defeated in eight elections. If you've never failed, you've never lived. Pretty awesome stuff, isn't it? In closing, I'm just going to share just a very quick personal story. I know many of you need to go, so it's not going to be long. But what I can tell you, and this is just my personal experience, what I can tell you is that the thing that radically changed my self-talk, radically, was when I developed a true relationship with God. And for some of you, that may make you feel uncomfortable. Because in nowadays, it's, we, it's almost taboo to talk about anything to do with religion. But I can only say from my personal experience that that was the thing that was the catalyst for, that radically changed my personal self-talk. And if you're interested in learning how to develop a more genuine, authentic relationship with God, please speak to me afterwards. Because I can tell you right now, single-handedly, that was the fastest way that I was able to change some major things in my life. And without a major change of shift of my self-talk and my belief system on certain things, it may have taken me much longer to ever get to where I am now. So, and I appreciate that, you know, this is not for everyone. But if that's you, please speak to me afterwards. Because um, my job is certainly not to preach. I would be a terrible preacher. Um, but I just thought that that's something helpful, uh, even if it helps this one person here. Um, so I wish you all very, very, um, the absolute very best in your endeavors in life. Um, believe you can. Change your self talk, and you could do some amazing things. Thank you. Please drive safe. Thank you. Just as an aside there, this is 
Um, one of the things that I found was really helpful for those of you who might be wanting to explore more about your spiritual side, you've got to remember that health is mind, body, and spirit. And many of us ignore that third spiritual leg. And one of the best things that got me on the right path with developing a real relationship with God was going to an Alpha course. And they, it's one of the most successful courses held worldwide now. And it's aimed at people who really want to be able to share what they genuinely believe in a a relaxed environment that is not judgmental and the purpose of an alpha course is not to become a Christian at the end of it the purpose of the alpha course is for people to actually share their beliefs and I've never known a person who's truly regretted going to an alpha course whether or not they chose to change their beliefs on certain issues so if ever you hear of an alpha course it's an amazing course that was one of the things that massively changed my life and I'd highly recommend it all right and it's a lot of fun. It's actually good banter as well, and you get a free meal. Thank you very much. <laughs>